Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about the application of maths to economics. Um, I'm in year 13. I know there's people in the background, so I'm not going to say it. Uh, I did economics at the Vice Lords GCC, done AS, done A level, did that early, and I'm doing third maths as well. So I thought I'd talk about both of those together. Uh, I've got a quick apology because Williamson, Alex Williamson said he couldn't be here because he's at a tea party in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try and be funny anymore because I can't as well. Uh, and I wanted to say it's actually a pleasure for me to do this, not because obviously I'm not talking to a whole audience at Cambridge or somewhere, but just because I really want to be a lecturer and a moulder as well. So hopefully this will be good practice for me. Um, I've got a couple as well. <laughs> And I just want to start with quite a basic thing that you should all be talking about. Um, you should all know about that, hopefully, because you should have been taught about that. Um, yeah, well, actually, I don't know, so I'm joking. But um, this is an equation for the price of a farmer's crop. Uh, t represents the time. So the price at time t is given by this. And it looks quite confusing, I understand. I don't expect to know that. I don't even know what it means. But only what I want to show you is that um, we use maths a lot in economics, and this is just one example of how we can use it. And there are numerous examples, and this is the essence of what I'm going to be talking about today, how we can use equations and various forms of maths in economics to help us. Um, and I'm going to quickly go over the plan for what I've got tonight. You are eating that. So I'm, I've done a bit of an introduction and I'm going to talk about economics at university, which is where I got the idea for this. Uh, I'm going to talk about why and how and when maths is applied to economics. The ones in green are where there's going to be no maths and I won't be doing any maths on the board. The ones in red, well, I'll be writing some stuff up and it's going to be a bit more mathsy. Um, I'm, I'm a bit worried about time because I have had a go at this and it takes a bit long. Uh, you can ask questions anytime you want. Um, and that's, yeah, so I'm going to start really, and if you, I'll start with anything, any of the times, I'll answer it. Um, so yeah, I've done a bit about that, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking to do economics at university because uh, it's just a subject that interested me most, but really, I don't like writing words, so I wanted to do something with numbers. So I looked at economics actually, and the courses you do, nearly all at university would be maths dominated for economics which will come as a bit of a shock to some of you who don't like maths. Um, but that's the way it is. Now, I put up the LSE first year course because I'm hopefully going to LSE. Um, and you do mathematical methods, so you do a course in maths. Uh, you do elementary statistical theory, a course in statistics, which is maths. Uh, you do economics. You actually do do some economics in the economics course, don't worry. Um, but that's still maths based because most of it is li that's just a pure maths. You won't do any economics in that. Uh, it's just to get your maths skills going. So they really, really do stress that you're good at maths. And the option, I'll do more maths because I want to. But you don't have to. If King's in one, I know. <laughs> um, so yeah, out of, the, out of the four courses, I've said that at least 2.5 are maths based. But again, I put the bottom five panic and go like maths. I don't know how many of you know a book called Jeff Baldwin. He's at LSE doing economics and history. And he doesn't do any maths. So if you hate maths and you want to do economics, don't worry. It's not the end of the world. You can still do it. It's fine. Um, now I'm going to talk a bit about why. Why would we bother applying maths to uh, economics? Because a lot of people wonder why, and a lot of people question it, which they are quite right to do. But um, there are some good arguments, and so I've written up a few questions for why, what people ask. So it does, does it maths and economics help us to explain it better? And I'll show you later on how it's helped me to explain economics better in certain cases, and it helps us in a lot of cases. And I've given you a handout which is about why and how it helps us, which you can read if you want. Um, it's not very interesting, it's not very good either. I was being a bit lazy, but yeah. Uh, the one I've got there at the end is end is much, much better. And the other thing is, uh, I've got three points on this side actually. The second is, is math relevant to economics? And I'd say, of course it is. If you look at all the uh, things in economics, nearly everything you deal with in economics, cost, profit, are in currency, inflation, interest rates, they're numbers, they're, they're quantities. And that's, that's the other main with quantities. A lot of economics is qualitative discussion, so when you're um, talking about force and normative economics, which as people should be familiar with, there's only normative statements. But there is a lot of economics which is based around ideas that are numbers. And when you're dealing with ideas that are numbers, you may as well use numbers. It makes make sense to me to, to, to look at our economic phenomena, which are variables and values, to look at them with maths, which deals with values. And the final point is a bit controversial, and it's 
maths can model scenarios, and we use maths to predict things in the future in economics, and, and that is a bit risky. And I'm willing to accept that it is a bit risky. I'm not going to try and fight for its case. The handout I give you is really interesting. Uh, it talks about that. Um, my point is that we can use it, and it does help us, but of course we just have to take it with a pinch of salt. We have to appreciate all the time and the limitations of what we're doing. There's, there's a lot of problems that could come about by using um, maths and economics, and we just have to consider them. As long as we consider them, it's fine. I don't see a problem. And what we actually find is that most people criticise the use of maths and economics. They say, oh, it brings about the wrong results. But in my case, it actually doesn't. It brings results that are fairly close to what they predict. The, the statistics usually aren't that far out. So that's why I'll talk a bit now about how we use maths. And the first point I put there is economics have a toolbox. Economists have a toolbox of techniques. And they use these techniques to help them deal with problems. Because economics is all about solving problems. And maths is one way we could potentially solve a problem. And there are two ways in maths, in economics, that we can solve problems using maths. And the first is when we look at an economic concept, say supply and demand. And we think, how can we use maths to help us? So we look at the economic concept and then we look at the maths that might help us. Now the reverse is when we think of a mathematical idea, say vectors, and we see maybe what economic concepts are linked to that. So I've put both of them up there. It's one way is when you look at the maths and then apply the economics, and the other way is when you look at the economics and apply the maths. Um, what have we got next? Yeah, and this is a really important point that I want to make because it's really, really important to consider the whole time when you do this lecture. Whatever I'm doing and whatever you do when you use maths and economics, you need to look at limitations and you need to look at potentially the problems of what you're doing. I mentioned that a bit earlier, but I'm just repeating what I said basically. But this point of it is probably the most important point that I've been thinking about recently when I've been thinking about my studies in economics, and that's that the theories you learn in economics are modelling what is happening naturally. And, well, not naturally, but what happens in the world. The theories themselves don't create what happens. We, what happens, happens, and then we look at it. And so whenever we're using economic theories and models, we have to remember that we're merely modelling what's happening. We're not, well, sometimes we actually, it, does, it doesn't determine what happens, but the worrying thing is that actually sometimes it does happen. That doesn't make sense. Occasionally it does because what happens is that people see the results that come from false maths in economics and they take them as true and they start doing what they're told is happening. And that affects the way people think and the way they act. So we, what I'm saying all the time is that any use of maths in economics has to be careful. And it has to be careful and we have to think of all the time about what we're doing when we're using maths in economics. And I think Paul, Paul Krugman, the Nobel laureate in that article, explains it a lot better than I can because he's a clever man. Um, but that's my point I'm trying to make. So now I've done most of the wordy stuff, I can actually move on to doing some maths. And um, everything in this should be all right for all you year 11s here. With your GCSE knowledge, uh, a bit later on it will get a bit harder and you might not understand, but don't worry if you don't understand because, um, I know that point. <laughs> not Matt Phillips, but you might understand some of them. <laughs> but why not? Um, yeah, no, you should, you should get all of this, this part anyway. So I want to talk first about um, how, I know I've talked about how, but there's two main cases in, in um, economics where we look at the maths. And the first is equilibrium. And equilibrium is something where things aren't changing. So it's something where things are the way they are, and they're staying the way they are, and they're not moving. And the obvious example is what I'm going to talk about is supply and demand. Because when a market is in equilibrium, it's in equilibrium, it's not moving. We can, if we look at it over time, so we look at how it changes over time, it's not going to change. So we can actually look at it quite easily, because we don't have to take time into consideration. It's not changing with time. The second is optimization, and that's a really, really important one to economics. Because we have to remember in economics we're looking at how to make the best out of the fact that we've got scarcity. And optimization is looking at how we can do the best or how we can have the most of something or the least of something. And the obvious example is when firms look at how they can maximise their profit and how they can minimise their costs. And it's a shame that I don't have more time because I could have gone through a whole example of how we look at that, but I decided not to. It's a bit boring anyway, so I did um, So I'm going to start with actually just going right back to basics and look at how we get to demand and supply from scarcity. So scarcity is the fact that we have unlimited wants in the world. We can't help the fact that we have more wants than we have resources to meet them. And this is a problem, and it's an annoyance to begin with. And that's where the subject comes from. And the thing is, we, we've got this problem with the fact that we've got limited resources and limited wants. And we have to, what we have to do is we have to deal with it, and we have to make the best out of it. And that's what we try and do. So one of the ways we help to deal with it is to look at opportunity costs. That's what you should call through for minute, the concept of opportunity costs. But another way, actually, many people don't realise what supply and demand is about is supply and demand is actually just a way to help us deal with scarcity. Because 
So looking at supply and demand and the equilibrium pricing quantity, that gives us, it gives us a, a measure of value. The price is a measure of value of something. And when we have to make choices in the world like we do, because of scarcity, we need something which tells us the value of something. So the problem is, say, that I want both Mars Bar and the Twix, but I can't have both. So the fact that there's a price involved represents how much value I'm going to get from it. And if there was a big price difference between them, it would help you make a decision. Obviously, that's terribly simplified because I'm not Twix as well as Mars Bars, but still. Hopefully you see my point. So I've looked at how supply and demand comes into that. And I just want to make one final point before I go on into Tetra, and that is many people think of a market as Canterbury High Street when someone's selling strawberries. But a market in economics is anywhere where there is an interaction between buyers and sellers. And um, so and the example I think of is Amazon. Amazon is a market. Um, and when people are buying and selling goods on Amazon, then it's a market. And even though people think of a market as Canterbury High Street, it's not just that, it's anywhere where people are selling good meat, people who are buying goods, be it physically or just over the internet. So, demand. Uh, now I can actually, I've seen talk about how we get to demand, we can look at demand. Um, before I write any maths, we're going to just quickly define what demand would be in words. So, demand really, for any good, is the, the there's three words. It's the willingness and the desire, they're really the same thing. And the ability, so the willingness and the desire is how much you want, is having the want to buy something, and the ability is being able to do it. So it's the willingness to design the ability to buy a good or serve a given good or service. So what we look at is you say there's a man called Mark who wants to buy apples and we draw a graph of his the price of apples. You have to excuse my hand, it's terrible. Against the quantity. This should all be familiar with me. I have his credit I'm going to rush through this. And we say it's linear for now. I'll go through the maths in a minute. But let's just say it's down the it is down the stuff really for apples. So at a given price, say 50p. He's willing to buy a certain amount of apples. This is fairly fundamental to which we're all familiar with. And then what we do with this individual demand curve, so this is just Mark, is that we move on from Mark and we look at the whole market, which is everyone who's willing to sell and buy apples. And we do what's called horizontal summations. I've written, yeah, I have written out the board. Horizontal summations. So now this becomes the quantity of apples. This is the quantity of apples that Mark wants to buy for Mark. And this is for the whole market. And so what we do is, it's called a horizontal summation because we sum over this axis, the x-axis. We, we add together the total quantities at each given price for the whole market rather than for just mark. A vertical summation where we be at each quantity, we add together the, all the prices and that's not really going to help us. So we move from the individual to the market by doing a horizontal summation, which is a mathematical technique. And so we end up with a demand, I haven't finished writing the quantity, <laughs> but it's okay the way what I was doing. Um, and so we move. We now have a thing, a demand curve for the market. So this is a talk about maths and economics, and I haven't mentioned any maths yet, so I should probably do that. I'm going to put these all up here, and you can think about them before I've said them. Um, oh, I've put up too much in one map. Um, so I'm meant to be talking about maths, so we'll actually talk about some maths now. Uh, the first point is that we've got a negative gradient, and we know in maths that a negative gradient is when one of these quantities on the axis rises, the other falls, or vice versa. So when price falls, quantity rises. This is a, this is a law of demand, in a sense. It's one of the few laws we have in economics. And, and the negative gradient is mathematically what tells us, so those of you who are familiar with maths, delta P by delta Q, that's mass for gradient, is negative. And that is mathematically saying us that the law of demand holds for the demand curve on this axis. Um, and so that is really how we, that's one way we, look, we have to consider mathematically of what we've drawn on here. The second is the shape of it. Now I've drawn it as a straight line, and it might not be a straight line, it could be anything. I've, it could be a curve, uh, I'm trying to think of it, I doubt it's a circle, but it could be, I don't know why not. Um, it could be anything we want it to be. And the fact is we use linear demand curves because it's simple. <coughs> In real life it's more like a hyperbola, it shouldn't have a bend on itself. Uh, it's more like that, and later on I'm going to look at an example when we look at this because it's um, it's more realistic. But for now we look at it as a straight line. It's not always a straight line. It could be a straight line, but it's not always, and it usually isn't in reality. But to help us, we look at it as a straight line. And I might ask Matt uh, Phillips a quick question here because he's been doing C3 and he thinks he's really good at it. And I 